All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I am the president for the Astronomy Club. Uh, so this is actually our last start party of the quarter. It is, uh, it, you know, so for me, it's my last, it's my last start party as president. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, uh, so I'm not going to keep you all waiting a lot longer than I have to. So I'll pass back off to Courtney. All right, hi guys. Um, I am Courtney Atkinson, and recently I've been studying the evolution of telescopes. So I'd like to start us off. Oh my goodness. Okay, with some important terms. Um, some of them that we need to know. A telescope, some, something that you may think of as a telescope is also a telescope, but really it's just an optical instrument that is designed to make distant objects appear nearer and in better focus. A medium is a substance that carries a wave from one location to another. Um, light doesn't necessarily need a medium, but in a medium, it must travel farther due to the interactions it has with atoms. Uh, so it winds up taking longer for it to get from one end of the medium to another. That's like passing from air to glass and back to like water. Those are all different mediums. Um, and then refraction, it really is just a change in the direction of a wave and then light can be refracted when it enters or leaves a medium. And then a mirror is a reflective surface. Lens is a piece of glass, usually glass, that's used for concentrating or dispersing rays of light. And then a satellite is just an orbit, a body orbiting a planet or another object. There we go. So telescopes were first developed as nautical telescopes. They were intended to help seafaring men see distant objects more clearly. Hans Lipperhe was created or credited with the invention of the telescope in 1608. This was 412 years ago, which is like four or five lifetimes. That's quite a lot. Being Dutch, his invention is fabled to have lent the Dutch a hand in the 80 years war against Spain between 1566 and 1648. You can see one of his telescopes, um, the picture in the bottom left. Between 1608 and 1610, Galileo Galilei pointed the telescope skyward and was credited with adapting the telescope for night sky viewing. He was even able to increase the magnification tenfold. In 1610, he published The Starry Messenger, that included observations he had made of the night sky with his telescope. Some of these were the rough moon surface. So it was originally thought that it was just a flat sphere, but it's really just like the earth, like we know now. Um, and he was credited with discovering that. And he also discovered the satellites of Jupiter, which we now call the Galilean moons. Some of the other things that he's credited with, but weren't in the starry messenger, was the phases of Venus, which is just like the phases of the moon, as well as discovering sunspots. Can you imagine he stared at the sun through that telescope? No wonder he went blind. One of his designs, um, Galileo's telescope design paralleled that of Lipperhey as he designed, his design used lenses. A convex lens, you can see on the left here, um, gathered the light and directed it to the concave lens on the right here, which then aimed the rays at one's eye. This resulted in a magnified image. So this was the basic design of a telescope. These refracting telescopes are still used today. In Wisconsin, the Yerkes Observatory is the largest refracting telescope built and it's still being used. It was 18 meters or 60 feet long. This design remained until the Great Plague of London between 1665 and 1666. Like many of us now, Isaac Newton was quarantined in his mother's basement playing around with physics, because that's what you do when you're in quarantine. Or at least that's what I do when I'm in quarantine. Here, he discovered and invented many things, including calculus and the infamous apple dropping thought experiment. He also discovered that light, when passed through a prism, 
split into all the different wavelengths. You can see this, this was actually me doing, this picture was actually me doing this experiment in my optics class. Each wavelength refracted or changed direction at a different angle when passed through a different medium. And the medium here was the prism, going from air to the prism to air again. Because of this refraction, differently colored colors within objects would require a readjustment of a telescope in order to appear clear. And you can see this on the far left image. Each of these colors are refracted at a different angle, and so therefore they require different distance to be in focus. To fix this, he thought a mirror may help. And here on the right, there's an image that shows a mirror reflecting to an image. So it doesn't have the issue. Uh, it, it helps to fix the issue with refraction. So Newton's realization led to the modern telescope design, where light is instant on the parabolic mirror. You can see this in the top picture. Light comes in, hits the parabolic mirror, which aims the light rays at a secondary mirror that's convex, which you can see also in the top picture. And that again aims the light rays toward the eyepiece where you're staring into. One of the places that uses this sort of telescopes is the European Southern Observatory, which you can see in the bottom picture here. It's quite pretty. The largest reflecting telescope currently is being built. It's targeted to be finished in 2025. It's called the European Extremely Large Telescope, and it's being built in Chile. Of course, it's European Extremely Large Telescope because people are not super creative, but it's self-explanatory. And this has a mirror. It's not the length of the telescope, but it's the mirror's um, diameter that's 39 meters, which is approximately 127 feet. That's crazy huge. So one of the things that we have to think about when we're talking about light and talking about telescopes is the spectra of light. I'm sure you've all seen this before, but Humans can see the visible light spectra, which is this little sliver in the middle. And uh, telescopes now, we can see all wavelengths with telescopes. The visible light, short wavelengths, and long light wavelengths. So one of the things that affects this is the refraction of the atmosphere. So if you have a telescope um, from the ground looking upwards, the parent star position is going to be different from the real star position because it's going through a different medium because of the refractive index. The refractive index is changing. And this kind of caused it, the telescope to be put into space. So we have all these different types of telescopes. Um, short wavelength telescopes and I zoomed in on this. It's the gamma ray, X-ray, and ultraviolet rays. Um, they must be located in space because high energy photons like this cannot penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. So ultraviolet telescopes, they use a special coating on the mirror that helps to re reflect the light. X-rays have their mirrors almost parallel to the incident light, which helps it kind of like bounce off a wall. Um, it's bouncing off the the mirror instead of uh, being reflected directly backwards. And then gamma ray telescopes, they record the photons um, that are in order to reconstruct an image electronically. So it's not exactly the same thing, but it's similar. And then long wavelength telescopes, many of these actually can be uh, on Earth because most of these pass easily through Earth's atmosphere. However, water vapor in the atmosphere absorbs a lot of infrared radiation that makes it through, so infrared telescopes are best to be put into space. Um, and infrared telescopes, some of the things that are special about that is that also requires a special coating to be able to re reflect it. And then micro microwave and radio telescopes, there you can see that in the bottom corner here, that's actually, uh, they're just tuned to the correct frequency of the light that you're trying to observe. And then the data is combined electronically into an image. Yeah, so here you can see 
all of different NASA's telescopes that are on the ground or um, in space and all through the spectrum, which is pretty cool, I think. Some of the most famous ones that you may think of is the Hubble telescope. That's the picture on the right, in case you were wondering. Um, and that one's pretty cool because that was our first or one of the first that was put into space. Um, and that didn't see infrared or many special types of light, but they're actually developing one currently called the James Webb Space Telescope. And that's what you see on the left here. Um, and this telescope is going to be looking at infrared light, which helps us to see different, more special things that we haven't been able to see before. And you can see the difference between the mirrors. The Hubble primary mirror um, is just one smooth surface, and it's about seven feet across. And the James Webb Space Telescope's primary mirror here is the big gold one. And that one's about 21 feet across. So it'll be able to reflect a lot more light. And um, it actually has this special gold coating in order to reflect infrared light specifically. And then one other thing that you might see and find interesting about this is that it has this hexagonal design. And this is due to the difficulty of like fixing and moving one huge piece of metal. Um, it's easier for them to be able to mount it if they have all these different pieces that are able to be put together and repaired if need be. Yeah, so scientific developments like this are not just made by scientists in labs. Like, you have to require all these different processes in order to actually put a telescope into space or to, you know, build a building even. There's in the scientific uh, process, I like to refer to Bronstein's model of science. This is one of my teachers, and I took a class with him where he expressed his model of science. And he likes to say that the process of science has to go hand in hand with the canon, and it's in a social medium. So basically, canon is like a general rule or principle that determines how something is judged. So that would be like what we teach our kids in fifth grade. Like all that science is part of our scientific canon. And, and the scientific process is like what I was doing, um, experimenting with my rocket engines, and, or like what we do as scientists at university. And, but all of this is in a social medium. So the social medium really is determined by a lot of different things. Um, you know, funding, all sorts of things like that. And we'll talk about that in a second. When we're talking about telescopes, some of the things that are evident, the social medium is evident, is because there's all of these people, Hans Liberche and Galileo, um, and I use the word credited with. Um, well, I use that word because he, they're credited with these um, inventions, but there's all these different people who may have discovered this beforehand. So Zacharias Janssen, he was from the same town of Hans Lippershe, and they may have worked together, but Hans Lippershe applied for the patent first, and neither of them wound up getting it actually, but he was credited with this invention because he applied for it first. He went after his dream. And Jacob Metinus also applied for the patent, um, and, but he was a little bit later than Hans, so of course he didn't get it. And then in Galileo's time, there was this guy named Thomas Harriet, and he used a spyglass to observe the moon. And he actually has drawings that predate Galileo's, but they were never published, so Galileo gets all the credit for being the pers first person to point these towards the sky. So some of the other aspects that may influence this type of scientific process are so religious or societal, so like what your values are. Um, funding, of course, that's a really huge one. We all have to apply for grants. Uh, wartime, you know, when, when the war was going, we had a lot more funding. <laughs> And then sickness, of course, you can see Newton was in a plague. We are literally at home right now 
and it's much more difficult to be able to like explore and all these different things and then also the connections that you have uh, if you have more connections and a bigger group of people it's a lot easier to find people to take you on as to be mentors and etc so some of the things in the process are an idea that has to be born and then the decision to actually develop it and what time to develop it the sharing of ideas in front of panels and conferences and getting funding for yourself the development and testing of all of your ideas and then finally the sharing and the recognition of the final product if you still have funding at that point but some of the takeaways the scientific process is not clean of course it is profoundly affected by the humans who Im implement it many inventions including the telescopes have been developed through the ages and are continuing to be perfected every day they're still developing some that are going up in space one of the biggest things that i want you to remember now is that during quarantine you could change the world <laughs> be like isaac newton and then of course keep an eye out for the next development of all the telescopes this is by nasa or the european space organization or any others that you can find thank you Thanks, Courtney. I'm going to toss it to Josh real quick. And if you all look down in your menu across the bottom, you'll see there should be a uh, reaction button where you can give thumbs up or clap and give a virtual thumbs up or clap and applaud Courtney's presentation. Courtney is graduating this year. Um, and this is her last presentation with us. I'm going to miss her immensely, but I do get to continue working with, with her um, during the next year. So I'm getting ready to open up the mics for everybody so you guys can ask questions. As soon as I can figure out how to do it. And unmute all. Okay, so I'm allowing you all to unmute yourself and you can go ahead and ask questions if you'd like to. Courtney, I had a question about um, climate change. How is that affecting the use of telescopes? Great presentation, by the way. Well done. Thank you. Um, sorry, I had to find the unmute button for a second. Um, you know, I didn't go into a lot of depth on my research with climate change specifically, although, um, I mean, a lot of the things that they have to think about now are very different from what they had to think about when they were, you know, developing um, Hubble, for example. Um, I believe that was in 2008. Um, and we know a lot more and we have a lot more restrictions. And those are good, good things. Um, but of course we have to think about all of that and try to develop all of this without as much waste. And um, you know, one of the things that's being developed now is rockets that are reusable, which is something that's super cool. Um, and I don't know that that would have come about uh, as quickly at least unless we had those restrictions. So uh, that kind of thing using reusable rockets when we put the James Webb into space. Yeah. Any other questions? I have one. Uh, good job, Courtney, on the presentation. Uh, what is the future of telescopes besides bigger? Yeah. And of course, getting into space, that's always the ideal. But I think I heard some technologies that try to um, reduce the distortion of the atmosphere. Is that part of the future for ground-based telescopes? Yeah, I had this in my notes. Um, but when I was looking at, let me show you the picture again, if I can find it. It might take a second. Oh, no, I can't, apparently. Ah. I can't. Um, okay, 
like this one, um, the European Space Organization, they're all developing ones that are on the ground currently. Um, and they are developing different aspects that um, do reduce the refraction of the atmosphere. And I can't remember right now <laughs> exactly okay. what it was that I read. Um, but I would direct you to the uh, ESO org i believe um just basically the european space organization website they they have stuff all over about this specific telescope and when i was reading about this one they did mention uh, the adv advancements about on-ground telescopes and then of course one of the biggest things is getting a telescope that is even farther from the earth um, so as space travel <laughs> increases then they'll be able to put telescopes that are farther and able to see, you know, different sorts of wavelengths even. That's one of the biggest things about the James Webb is developing the infrared telescope that's going to space. So, Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and start to wrap up. Uh, thank you, Courtney, again, for your lovely presentation. Uh, and so that's pretty much all we have for you all. If anyone is interested in trying to keep up to date with the star parties that we will start to have at the beginning of the next academic uh, year, uh, starting in fall, then uh, a good way to go about that is to either contact the physics department about where we where you can uh, to get added to the, uh, so that way to tell them, how, ask them how to get added to the Astronomy Club email list. Alternatively, you can visit the, the uh, Astronomy Club's actual websites. I will go ahead and put the uh, URL in the description. At the bottom of every page for the Astronomy Club, there is a subscription thing where you can put your email and you will actually get notified about these events. So I'll go ahead and put it in the chat now. Okay. Add, oh, sorry. I said I'm proud of you, Courtney. Thank you. Good job. I appreciate it. You guys came. We have one more event that's coming up on the first Saturday of June. It is um, our virtual planetarium show. Um, it'll be at noon, and it's short films that CW students have created using a program called Worldwide Telescope, and it'll run about an hour. Um, it, I will drop the email for you guys to, if you're interested in learning about that, I'll drop the email in the chat for you and we'll get you the information for that website after that login also. I'd like to mention that if you guys have any questions that are, um, you can't find all these specific links, you can always email the physics department directly if you go to the physics, the CW physics website, and they're able to direct you to the correct people. Yeah. All right, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, uh, if, uh, so that, yeah. That's pretty much all we have. So uh, have a good night. Thanks. For that. Thank you much. <laughs> Thank you.